We're going to continue. I'm going to continue on this uh, handout, the sheet, uh, with problem number three, clairvoyant. Ha ha. She won the jackpot at Sam's Town Casino in Tunica. May collect her winnings in one of two ways $10,000 annually for 20 years, plus $500,000 at the end of 20 years, or $200,000 today. If her required rate of return is 8%, what should she choose? As I say here, there are a couple of ways to solve this problem, but let's say that she calculates the present value of the annuity and lump sum together, then compares that to the cash payoff that's offered today. There is a principle that um, is, let's say, assumed here or demonstrated here. It's called present value additivity. That is, in the case of this stream of payments that we're dealing with, we have an annuity and we have a lump sum. We could solve for these individually and add them together and get the, uh, you know, the sum of those because basically the present value of that combination is, can be legitimately determined by, by evaluating those or present, uh, discounting those individually and then adding them together. Uh, but we can actually let the calculator, of course, solve for this at one, in one fell swoop. It makes it, it makes it easier for us. So we have here uh, a payment scheme that is that involves an annuity and a lump sum. We will see this again later when we deal with corporate bonds. But that annuity is of ten thousand dollars per period, plus five hundred thousand at the end. Let's see. The end is twenty years. Uh, or tw yeah, 20 years and the uh, required rate of return is 8%. By the way, I haven't really, I didn't say anything about uh, whether it was 8% compounded annually, monthly, semi-annually. The uh, kind of the vanilla assumption is if there's no statement about frequency of compounding, then it's annual compounding. Um, now, if it had said the payments, uh, let's say these, these payments were monthly, then it would be assumed that if we have monthly payments, we've got monthly compounding. That's just a basic assumption uh, that we use. So it's something uh, that we, uh, we make. So we want to make sure to uh, recognize that. Let's see. Let's solve for the present value of this uh, stream of payments. Let me clear out my calculator. First thing, 10,000 is the payment. 20 is N. Eight is the I, five hundred thousand is the future value. And when I solve, compute present value, it tells me two hundred five, four hundred fifty six. So um, let's see. Seems like there are a couple of things here maybe to note. Um, well, I've already mentioned about the, the frequency of compounding. Let's say, um, well, the present value of that stream is 205,456. Now, she can either take this stream of payments, and again, she's not getting 205,456 uh, in cash today. What she's getting is a stream of payments that has this value to her today, given her required rate of of return given the amount and the timing of these cash flows. So she can either take this stream of payments, which has this value, it's worth this amount to her, or she can take the $200,000 in cash. Well, she'll take this because it's greater. This scheme here has a greater present value to her than does the $200,000 today. Now, sometimes I might have somebody saying, well, if I need, maybe does she need the money? But she needs the money really badly right now. She might prefer to have that $200,000 but she has to wait to get this money. I said, you would be right, except this 8% here is supposed to incorporate how badly she needs money today. Uh, it's one of those essential elements of any rates of return, the real risk-free rate based on supply and demand for investment funds. It's gonna reflect productive opportunities in the economy and time preferences for consumption by individuals. In other words, the degree to which she needs to have that money today how pressing her needs are 
the higher, the greater those are, the greater her required rate of return. So assuming this represents, that this reflects her required rate of return, once we crunch the numbers here, it's kind of a no-brainer. If the present value of this stream here exceeds the present value of the payment that she's been offered, she'll keep the stream of payments. If this had turned out to be lower than 200,000, she'd take the cash payoff today, no matter how many dollars are out here. You know, the, uh, the, the interest rate or the required rate of return represents sort of an exchange rate between money today and money tomorrow. Uh, these dollars, matter of fact, the first $10,000 payment and the second one and the third, they're all different, really. They're, they're, they're the same in nominal amounts, but in terms of what really counts, okay, the present value, they're different because they occur at different points in time. And of course, we would know 500,000 you, you get in 20 years. It's not like 500,000 today, okay? So we recognize inherently a time value of money, okay? A, month, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. This actually allows us to, let's say, put some teeth into that. That is to approach that problem of valuation, uh, let's say, objectively and, uh, and more critically. Okay, there's another problem here. Let's go ahead and go through it. A local business is for sale with an asking price of 290,000. Your estimates of the cash flow uh, after tax are include and the uh, are, are shown here. It says the year five uh, cash flow after tax, CFAT, I'm sneaking in a term on you there, includes the proceeds from the sale of the business. It's a risky enterprise, so you believe a 25% required rate of return is appropriate. So here we have this arrangement. I'll just set up a timeline here like you have on your paper. And once again, I think I can cut to the chase and not worry about the, all the zeros here since these are all nice, even, even and round uh, thousands of dollars. 95, 525, okay? So those are your amounts and the timing. Now, we have this great thing in the, in the calculator, a cash flow worksheet. You should have a handout uh, on that that kind of walks you through the calculation. In order to access that, that uh, cash flow worksheet, you simply press the CF key, right? Oops, <laughs> wrong one. CF key right there. And I'm going to clear it out. Second, clear work. That's how to eliminate any information that's in there. Well, it's prompting me for CF0, 290. That's a negative. I enter that, I scroll down 72, enter, scroll down to C2, that's 80, enter, scroll down to uh, C3, 95, enter, scroll down to C4, 525, enter. I can always check my values by simply scrolling back through. There's nothing, minus 290, one, two, three, Sure enough, I've got good values in there. And uh, I'm gonna solve uh, for this problem by the, um, first of all, by the, uh, the present value approach. I'm gonna solve for what's called the NPV, the net present value. Net present value is defined as the present value less the initial outlay. In other words, it's what that investment is, is worth above and beyond its cost. Um, I'm going to solve here, let's see, using a 25% required rate of return. When I press that NPV key, the first thing it does is prompt me for a required rate of return in 25. I enter that, scroll down, and it says NPV is zero because I haven't told it to compute. Ah, it tells me the NPV is 82.5. Now, what that means is,